basically what's happened is uh, the first of the storm is hit and fish came straight into the stern um, while I was still in bed. Uh, it's a little dramatic moment while I had to put on some clothes and come out and sort the situation, but I wanted to show you what Sure that's going to happen for you. So, community. So it's President's Day, Monday, the 18th of February, 2019. And that little clip you saw uh, was the storm coming in that I mentioned in the last video that was coming in on Thursday. So it blew in and the temperature dropped. Um, just been raining ever since pretty much the day after that video. So uh, yeah, it suddenly really is winter here in Greece. And that uh, boat got blown right into the back of me. I had to fend it off and couldn't handle the situation on my own. So um, luckily, um, I was able to call people. Lots of people came to help. So um, yeah, that was an interesting storm. Um, it's just been a deluge um, of rain. So last, last year, there were three days of rain um, in the winter. So they were droughts. Uh, we started off in December with massive amounts of rain. And really, we've had 11 days of sunshine, one of them all ridiculously warm, like the previous video. And the rest of the time, it's been raining and raining very hard. So the, the, the roads have been washed away. There are a lot of uh, villages cut off up in the mountains and uh, yesterday there was a car that was actually washed off uh, the main road into a river. Uh, four people inside called for help on their cell phone and uh, they, apparently they were washed out to sea so there was a helicopter search um, but they haven't been found. So uh, yeah this uh, a real crisis of water. The in the end, I think it's probably uh, good because I hear there's probably four years of water that we've just got now since uh, in this winter. So, yeah, I think that uh, Greece and this area in general is slated to be uh, very, very dry shortly. So, uh, it's probably a blessing. So, anyway... Yeah, so um, last Friday, uh, Trump declared himself uh, emperor, effectively, um, of America. So everybody should have seen that coming, I'm pretty sure. And hence the, the thumbnail that you just, you just saw there. Um, uh, very, very serious. And yeah, we'll do, we'll do Trump maybe a bit. Um, but uh, personally, I've been on Reddit trying to browse people telling them uh, there probably is a crisis on the southern border and I think it's climate change so yep liberals get over yourselves uh, it's not all Islamophobic uh, I think you should start to think that there really is a crisis brewing and the government's not telling us yeah so anyway the weather has been crazy nobody can deny it around here the uh, everyone knows it all the sailors know it they know why um, there's we went from a medicaine um, just before I arrived at this island um, and actually while I was here um, and that's a hurricane in the Mediterranean. You don't get them. So that's a new name and probably for a phenomena that's going to be, um, I'm expecting to be seasonal from 
here on out. Uh, soon after I arrived here, there was a water spout. Uh, that's a tornado at sea, and it just passed past the breakwater over there where the waves have been crashing over in tremendous height these last few days. Been quite spectacular. Uh, that tornado would have taken my boat and basically dumped it on the concrete. I did. I was actually in town. I didn't actually see it. But, um, yeah, that's uh, when I came back <clears throat> from town. Everybody was pretty excited and they showed me their cell phones. And that was a biggie. That was a biggie. But as all these things, it just passes. People you know, were joking the other day. They said, ah, oh, Medicaid, nobody can even remember when that was. And that's pretty much it. People are in denial. They're in uh, chronic denial. You can see the weather breaking up. So, yeah, in America, there's been a lot of storms. Uh, a lot of storms where, where my kids live, sto snowstorms, and, of course, the extreme cold there. What they didn't mention with the extreme cold was uh, that tongue of cold that came down into North America. There's a more worrying component is that an equal amount of hot air went up into Antarctica. So that brings us to what I promised you would I'd, I'd go into the science a bit more. So here's the science of climate catastrophe in 20 minutes, if I can do it. So you have to fact check me on everything I say. <clears throat> I'll just sketch out the basics and give you a bit of guidance because there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of misdirection. And I think uh, we should probably start with a misdirection. So one of the first people to introduce you to, there are quite a lot of personalities involved here, is a guy called Michael Mann. Michael Mann is... How would I describe him without being completely pejorative? Um, he He's basically, he's not really a scientist. He's a paid spokesperson, basically a, a mouth for hire that builds himself on an expert in atmospheric science or something like that. Anyway, um, he takes strong issue with realists and the methane bomb. He doesn't have any counter to say about it. Uh, he doesn't have any science to contradict anybody. He just comes out and just uh, basically slanders anybody, any any climate realist. Uh, particularly his his focus is against Guy McPherson, which I put the link there to the McPherson paradox, and I'll be going over that shortly too. But really, uh, Michael Mann is just he just uh, does ad hominem attacks on individual realists, um, and it's just uh, propaganda, I think, is, is the best way, uh, is the best thing, thing to call it. So, <clears throat> what he's saying is, you know, ah, uh, you see, this is as bad as climate denialism, is this catastrophizing that uh, he calls realists catastrophists, um, without saying why it isn't a catastrophe or some science that disproves it. Now, the uh, catastrophizing, he says, is dangerous because it it implies that humans have no agency. There's nothing we can do about this. And I think basically the thing he needs to realize is it's not that, that realists are saying humans have no agency. Of course they have agency. That's how we got here. I think what people need to realize is that that Agency is an anti-Midas touch. Uh, everything we do in terms of a fix turns to shit. And I'll go into why. There are good reasons for it. But the idea that there's some... Well, they don't say magic bullet anymore. They say magic shotgun because now we're just going to pepper denial at the inevitable. Um, yeah, the, uh, the thing is that... Of course, there's stuff that can be done, and they will probably go ahead and do this crazy ass shit like a big old scrubber, a CO2 scrubber. Um, but it's a huge mistake, and um, I think maybe the next video should be dedicated to that scrubber, because it's probably going to happen and stuff like it. And I want to paint out what we're doing and why we shouldn't do it. Uh, we, we're chewing up time to get 
to where we need to be, in my view, and that's a, a quality finale. Um, we need time for catharsis. We need time for reconciliation. Uh, we, I'm uh, maybe sticking a bit of retribution. I don't know. Uh, possible, and um, why not? And but uh, just to get to a point of acceptance, um, just to get philosophical, just to appreciate all the the history that of man and uh just a just an appreciation of the ups and downs this fantastic story just a retrospective to to look back um and then time to prepare um also uh to get into a state of mind which i call ataraxia which is a greek words that I uh, will go into as well, because I think that's an important state of mind um, to have when facing our death. And I think the way it's going to go down, it's going to go down as a hysterical shit show on a global scale. And I think it's, you know, hell, I don't, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go down that way. And I prefer it if as many people thought the same way I did. And we're only going to get there if we get over um, this climate denialism on the one hand, and then um, also this denial of the real realism, Um, just the kind of denial that says that we got to do geoengineering fixes, um, which I think is not a good thing. Um, So anyway, When you investigate all of this, then, as I said, uh, I think the thing that's going to get us is the methane bomb. So let's go over the methane bomb, or what some people call the methane dragon. Scientists have called this the methane dragon for a long time. Now, if you start looking into it, I think the very first bit of misdirection you'll get is somebody will say, no, no, we've looked at methane. It's just being alarmist. Uh, there's a, a recent paper that came out that said the methane seepage is not as high in the lakes up in the tundra. Uh, they looked at satellite data, I think, and looked at the bubbles coming up. So they can see very tiny deflections in the lakes and assume that they, they're bubbles. And so, even from space. And so, they did a large area survey, which hasn't been done, and they said, no, it's not the seepage isn't nearly as bad as people think. The lakes are growing. Um, so so what's happening is, uh, in this scenario, so this is really a kind of a slow burn, and what's happening is the heat is melting the tundra. Inside the tundra are all these bugs from the last ice age, and essentially they do one of two things. They either wake up, um, you know, kind of Jurassic Park, like, and start munching where they left off when they were last frozen, um, if they have oxygen, they create methane, and you know how lethal that is, 200 times more potent as a greenhouse gas. If they don't have oxygen, they just create CO2, uh, but uh, dying creates CO2. But e- either way, it, it looks very like they've reached runaway already. So just that process alone is a feedback loop that's probably self-sustaining already. So they would go hyperbolic if you just look at the methane production on at some at some point um so yeah they alone are a, are a killer so they they're probably about five feedback loops that are already in runaway and so any one of them could get us but i think uh so the the five are uh, they're, they're all things like uh, you know the sea ice is uh, okay, that's probably gone. I'll go to the sea ice. But the, the glaciation is the glacial retreat in the Arctic. There's the third Arctic, uh, which is basically Tibet and the Himalayas. There's a heating effect now that they're seeing in the upper atmosphere. The adiabatic lapse rate, or how quickly things are supposed to cool as you rise, is is slowing, and I think quite dramatically, which means that those the high area is melting. People are not looking at that the, around the the glaciers, um, you know, in Tibet essentially and the Himalayas. Uh, so that's the third Arctic um, is also in trouble, and it's just but there are many of these feedback loops that seem to all be running away now the clathrates so um, 
if you watched the video that I mentioned previously um, down below, I think there's this, uh, this one. Let me have a look where, if I can find it quickly. Um, yeah, so. Let's see, yeah, that's that's the one. So, yeah, Natalia um, Shakova and this other guy called Igor. So, that is a very alarming uh, wake up call. So, it's from 2012, and she's talking about. Methyl, methane hydrates, um, and that's the, the methane bomb. Uh, they, they clathrates is another word that they used for, and so that's the methane you have to worry about, not the melting tundra one, which is they use as a misdirection. Say, oh, no, 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 methane is fine. And it's like, and then you say, really? Clathrates? And then they will change the subject very quickly once you get into clathrates, because clathrates is, is the bomb that's probably going to take us out. So, clathrates. Um, the first time I heard about clathrates, I was nine years old, and it was in Ripley's Believe It or Not. I read in the newspaper, but as a kid, um, about ice that burns, you know, naturally occurring ice that you can actually put a match to, and it will, uh, once it starts to melt, burst into flame and burn all the way down into a little puddle of water um <laughs> it just melt itself and burn at the same time which i thought was absolutely fantastic as a kid uh, now these are all over the world they in sedimentary layers uh, particularly under the ocean normally about one kilometer deep uh, and yeah they're all worrying uh, but I if, have to introduce you to ESAS. Uh, you almost definitely will hear about ESAS in the in the time to come. And ESAS is the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. So it's a huge Arctic Shelf. Uh, it's a huge undersea shelf. It's the biggest one in the world. I think, I think in terms of about half the size of Europe. And um, that it's... Um, it's clathrates. Uh, they estimate it's uh, um, a thousand gigatons, so that's twenty kilometers deep. Where most are about one kilometer deep of those uh, clathrate deposits. So it's it's a vast, vast amount. And in terms of what the release they're scared of is probably 50 gigatons. So 50 gig gigaton and, and that video that you saw about uh, uh, Natalia Shakova, um, she she actually tears up, um, and that's in 2012, and they're saying that that could blow at any time, and that's the methane bomb, 50 gigaton eruption of clathrate material just coming off from the seafloor. So the Eastern Siberian shelf is vast but very shallow it's uh, the water's about 50 meters deep which is means an amateur diver could go down there and putz around for about 15 to 20 minutes quite easily and so there's nothing stopping the methane coming up straight from the sea floor it has a cap of permafrost um, all the clathrates around the world the deposits have some kind of cap but this one is permafrost and so it should melt shortly after the uh, the Arctic is ice-free. So when is the Arctic ice-free is a very important question. It should have been ice-free last year, 2018. It'll almost certainly be ice-free in September this year, 2019. Why that's important is all the energy that has previously been going in to melt the ice will now be just warming the water. So when all the Arctic ice melts, Earth loses its albedo, which means there's not the sun's not reflecting off that ice. It's now just going straight on to dark blue. It goes from white to dark blue. Now that difference is significant. To give you an idea of how significant it is, is imagine you get a beaker of, of ice uh, at zero degrees, a beaker, one kilogram of ice. You melt it with a bit of energy, a Bunsen burn or something underneath, until it's zero degrees of water. So that's just the energy that took to basically make the ice into water at the, roughly the same temperature. Now, now you have one kilogram or one liter of water. You put an equivalent amount of energy into that water. And the question is, how hot 
will the water get with that equivalent amount of energy that it took to melt the ice now just warming water well it comes to about 80 degrees celsius so zero degrees ice to zero degrees water that that amount of energy that it took to the latent heat of of uh, vaporization of of ice is now just is pumping into the water. It's not to say that the Arctic waters will get 80 degrees Celsius. That's to say that how the energy will be converted when it's heating water. Um, so the danger is that the water will, an ice-free Arctic will rapidly warm up. The water, the sea will warm up. So then September will probably be ice-free. Uh, then every month next to September, earlier and earlier each month will be added and very rapidly. It's kind of a runaway process now. Once the Arctic is ice free, it'll never come back. There's nothing we can do about it. And it's warming the permafrost cap on this huge 20 kilometer deep deposit of methane, methane hydrates. Now, if you get in your car and you drive 20 kilometers, and imagine that going straight down, there's an awful lot of this stuff down there. If we used it as a fuel, it would take um, about a thousand years to burn through it at the current energy consumption that we've got. So, so it's vastly more than the energy we've consumed on the planet so far. And of course, you can easily find some moron from the energy companies that will say this is fantastic we can it's a science problem we can get this stuff up from the bottom of the arctic and yeah every time we do that it just melts and bursts into methane but get the technology right invest in me and we will sort that out because there's almost unlimited energy out there this the insanity runs deep uh, so when there's no cap on these clathrates, then uh, you can expect these bursts. It's the various ports of the Arctic Sea just bubbling with methane. So how thick is the uh, uh, the cap? It's pretty much gone already. So that's the problem. It's just wherever the methane can bubble up, it will. Now, this is a seismic, uh, seismically active region. So, and it hap It so happens that climate change has now been shown to uh, make earthquakes more prevalent. So, yes, um, it's just a ticking time bomb. Now, there are other things uh, to know about. One of them is. Pingos. So if you've never heard of a pingo, all you really need to know is when the pingo goes, you go too. So pingos are about, they mounds. So they're on land, but they're lots under sea. They're basically zits on the sea floor of clathrates. And they kind of pop. Uh, so they're about maybe 70 meters high, that kind of thing. They can be up to 70 meters, maybe 600 meters wide. They're observing them every summer. Um, to see that if they pop, they leave a crater. Now, I strongly suspect that that crater, you have to view them as volcanic craters. They're basically where the methane will bubble up. Um, so, yeah, as those zits pop, uh, that's probably exposing the cap on the flue where there'll be a migration path for the methane to just come straight up. When it comes straight up, it's straight up into the atmosphere. Um, how quickly? Well, a 50 megaton burst would quickly get into the upper atmosphere in the northern hemisphere. So it's pretty much like getting an egg, just cracking it into cake mix, and it's the atmospheric equivalent of just stirring it in. So uh, very rapid. We're talking weeks, uh, months to spread over the northern hemisphere. Now, a burst like that what would it do? Well, uh, estimates are that it would add po possibly 1 to 1.3 degrees Celsius in a couple of weeks. So it would double the global warming that we've done in the entire Industrial Revolution, and it would do it within weeks. So if uh, so, now we're currently at a temperature of, well, if you use a proper baseline, not the IPCC's fake baseline of mid 
Industrial Revolution, if you go right back to, say, 1750 baseline, then we're at uh, 1.73 degrees. We're probably safe, reasonably, at 1.5, so we've overshot already. You would add 1.3, there would be crop failures instantly um, that season, probably when it blows. So, yeah, that would pretty much... uh, things would go downhill very rapidly um, as soon as you got a blowout like that. So, well, um, that's clathrites. Uh, I'll put a few more links if I can find them uh, down below, but uh, that's it, 20 minutes. So I will do another video and carry on maybe with I'll just check if I've uh, if I've covered most of the stuff in this, but it, but yeah, essentially I'll go over why you probably don't want to be doing the scrubber. Uh, maybe before that, go over global dimming, and global dimming is kind of like the bow, the catch twenty two, the clincher on the top. So I'll mention that in the next video. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Love you all. Bye.